Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, there's a lot of news. Last week's been slammed. First, we had the Jay and Linus competition that we did, and we ran a recap for that. But in hardware news, Sony and the PlayStation 5 looking to be interested in liquid metal, something that we've talked about a lot on this channel in the past. NVIDIA is prepping for its Ampere reveal with the RTX 3000 series. There's rumors of a 3090 that we've also privately confirmed. We'll talk about that in this show. Mozilla, unfortunately facing layoffs. Intel's Architecture Day for uh, its upcoming processors has a lot of information that we need to get through as well and try and compress as much as we can, and a couple of other things. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake's Tough RAM RGB memory, available from 3000 megahertz up to 4400 megahertz in eight gigabyte by two configurations. The Thermaltake Tough RAM uses 10 addressable RGB LEDs for bright illumination and comes in both black and white kits of memory. Learn more at the link in the description below. So first up, quick GN news item. The mouse mats and mod mats are finally back in stock. The mod mats were really low on inventory for the mouse mats. We've already sold through 50% of what we ordered with back orders. If you had a back order, it'll be shipping within the next few days or so. So you won't have to wait too long to get a shipping notification for that. And if you've wanted one, you can place an order now. It will ship immediately. Uh, until we run out again anyway, and we've, we're really low on the stock for the mod mats. Thought we were ahead, but we're not. Now's a good time to pick one up, though, if you wanted to get something from the GN store anyway on store.gamersnexus.net, because through August 20th, we are going to be giving 10% of the store's revenue to Eden Reforestation projects, which we've worked with in the past. It's about, I think it was last year where we worked with them and working with the community to do uh, some match donations, which we're doing again with the community, and then also doing the uh, store percentage plus our distributor through some in, and he's doing that again as well. We were able to end up last year planting 90,000 trees through Eden Reforestation Project. They're really good. We've liked working with them, and uh, they basically employ people who are in extreme poverty, so it helps them out from the personal side of things, and then they also uh, can help resolve some deforestation issues around the world. So we like working with them, and through August 20th, we're giving 10% of the store revenue to them. Uh, if you'd prefer to donate just directly to them and bypass the store, that's completely fine with me. We'll have a link in the description below, and we're matching up to $1,500 total in viewer donations again. So that's our promo going on right now. Uh, I actually just got back from QC and a bunch of the mod mats and doing the signing for the ones that were uh, bought signed. So they're good to go. They'll be shipping immediately if you want to place an order. Okay, first story is the Sony PlayStation 5 and some patents that indicate, finally, something we've been waiting to report on for over a year now. But we kept it a little bit quiet. Uh, there was a hardware news piece we posted probably last year sometime about the PlayStation 5 and its expected-to-be expensive cooling solution. We'll definitely take one apart as soon as it comes out and we get one so that we can show off what it is that's supposed to be so expensive. But uh, for a while now, since that news item, we've known that the PlayStation 5 and Sony was in consideration for using liquid metal as the thermal interface, as opposed to the standard thermal paste. So the decision wasn't finalized at the time, and officially, we don't really technically know if the PS5 has liquid metal in it, but it was in early engineering plans when the cooling solution was being designed, and there's a new patent filing that, translated by Google, says the following, quote, in the semiconductor device of patent document two, instead of a grease, a metal that is liquefied by heat during operation of the semiconductor chip is used as a heat conductive material between the semiconductor chip and the radiator, end quote. So either way, there is an official interest from Sony at this point to use liquid metal and its products in the future. Uh, we'll see, again, we can't like 100% state that this means the PS5 will have it, but it probably will. And for the last over a year now, we've known that they were looking at liquid metals. We don't know exactly which liquid metal supplier uh, Sony intends to use. There's a couple of them out there, and it's probably going to be dictated by price when you're talking about a company as large as Sony. So they're likely going to go with the cheapest supplier they can get. But anyway, that'll be something fun to look at when we do the teardown, see if they ended up going with liquid metal or not for this one, or if they're saving it for something that might be hotter in the future still. Next up, NVIDIA appears to be prepping for its Ampere reveal. Not really surprising. The RTX 3000 series has been in the rumor mill for longer than any NVIDIA GPU we can remember in recent history. It's had the most exposures over the last five months or so now. And in what's been the most leaked NVIDIA launch in recent memory, it seems that NVIDIA may finally be preparing to announce the consumer-facing Ampere cards in an official capacity. 
A team of NVIDIA is keen to celebrate the last 21 years of computing and computer graphics, according to its event countdown page. Separately, there's a blog post harking back to the good old days of 1999, where 640 by 480 was a high resolution, and where we saw the birth of NVIDIA's GeForce brand with the inaugural GeForce 256 card. It was also the year that 3DFX essentially ceded market leadership to NVIDIA, thanks to how popular the 256 was, and it spelled the end, ultimately, for 3DFX altogether. That is a story for another time, though. The gist of NVIDIA's 99 blog post is that it will, quote, usher in a new era, akin to what it did in 99 with the GeForce 256. So, NVIDIA has announced a digital event taking place on September 1st, with NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huan leading the show. The entire focus around this is PC gaming so far, so consumer-facing Ampere cards seem certain at this point. However, as NVIDIA continues its hype train, it's entirely possible that this will be the vehicle in which NVIDIA introduces something else entirely new, such as maybe new RTX technology, or maybe just something that hasn't really been rumored as much, like the 3090, although we'll be talking about that today. So it sounds like the dates are shifting around a little bit. In last week's news episode, we talked about how September 9th was one of NVIDIA's target dates, it looks like September 1st for the announcement, and then sometime after that will be card availability. We don't know when the review embargoes will lift at this point, uh, but obviously as soon as we're able to cover them in an official capacity, we will. So it sounds like the September 9th date was in flux and either won't come to fruition, it's been pulled forward to the 1st, or will be for something else. Uh, as for the rest, we've been told to expect an 80 SKU equivalent at first, that'd be a 2080 equivalent, uh, taking its place in the line, with a flagship to follow shortly after. The 3090 has been in the rumor mill a lot lately, and in speaking with some of the board partners, it sounds like that might be the flagship that NVIDIA intends to launch shortly after its 80 SKU. We don't know what the official naming is going to be. They could do TI, but in terms of the actual product stack, the naming's mostly irrelevant. It's just something that will be slotted in above the initial launch. Next news item then, also related to NVIDIA. NVIDIA's ship continues to leak, and this time it's with a tactical PDF document that was released as spotted by video cards with a Z. It's been since taken down, and it mentions Micron's yet to be announced GDDR6X memory. The document doesn't offer too many details, but it does offer a glimpse at what G6X will look like. As was the case with G5X, it seems Micron and NVIDIA have been working closely together to bring G6X to the market. The document states that GDDR6X will have a 21 gigabit per second per pin rate, while also listing a gigabytes per second range of 912 to 1008. That would mean that G6X would be capable of crossing the 1 terabyte per second threshold, and G6X also seems to operate over a 384-bit bus for at least one of the higher-end cards. Also, as Anantech mentions, it seems Micron is moving to PAM4 signaling, which would have implications for data per clock cycle and power consumption metrics as well. And you can read their write-up, which we've linked in our show notes below, if you'd like to learn more about that. The document that was leaked does explicitly mention an RTX 3090 SKU, and it lists that with a board configuration of 12 gigabytes, or 12 pieces, or modules. Micron seems to have confirmed accidentally at this point on NVIDIA's behalf that it is indeed working on an RTX 3090, or whatever they end up calling it. The VRAM sizing here should be 12 gigabytes of GDDR6 in theory, and uh, as for the bandwidth and other specs, we need to wait and see what NVIDIA finalizes for its memory bus and the rest of its memory subsystem before we look further into that. But hopefully they'll have an architecture day like they've had in the past, because we always take away a ton of information from those that we can dig into for the product coming up. So we're sure to learn more in September, which isn't that far at this point. If anything is left to leak from NVIDIA, now is probably the time to do it. We'll just see if NVIDIA can plug the holes or not. This has definitely been the leakiest that ship's ever been. Mozilla up next, facing layoffs and looking to restructure. Mozilla announced that it was preparing for another round of layoffs and internal shuffles and reorganization. The news comes at a time when Mozilla and the rest of the world is feeling the impact of the current pandemic. As Mozilla puts it, quote, economic uh, conditions resulting from the global pandemic have significantly impacted our revenue, end quote. As a result, Mozilla is expected to cut its workforce by 250 people. Mozilla previously underwent a smaller round of layoffs back in January, where the company trimmed its workforce by around 70 people. 
The cause for that particular layoff stemmed from a protracted rollout of revenue-generating products and services between 2019 and early 2020. Along with the current layoffs, Mozilla looks to be embarking on a broader restructuring this time, and that includes a focus on revenue-driven product. Uh, for instance, Mozilla's had its $5 VPN solution built into Firefox for a while now. So Mozilla and Firefox have long been sort of an anti-Google or anti-Chrome option, and Mozilla has increasingly built in more privacy-related features to its browser. We actually largely use Firefox here these days. So in the world of internet br browsers, privacy uh, clearly does not pay the bills and is a difficult product to generate revenue on the back of. So to that end, Mozilla is experimenting with more ways to drive revenue directly from its user base without stepping outside of the box that it has painted itself into with regards to privacy. Again, Mozilla's subscription-based privacy and security tools have been the most recent exploration by the company, and that would include the VPN that they have available. Mozilla will also be looking at ways to drive user growth, which will be an important metric for the company going forward. Firefox's share of the browser market has tumbled repeatedly over the years, but most recently, it actually lost some of its browser market share to Edge, the one that Microsoft makes and forces upon you with Windows 10. Uh, this is in the wake of Microsoft's Chromium-powered Edge browser, particularly when it most recently in the updates that both Paul from Paul's Hardware and I complained about on Twitter, where uh, Windows forced the Edge browser open and made it very difficult to get rid of when applying one of the recent Windows updates. So Firefox is in a, as a, a second place position browser, it's in the most risk of losing user base to Edge uh, as that rolls out, but either way, Hopefully, Firefox can figure something out. Next one, Intel Architecture Day 2020. This was a big news story from the last couple of days where Intel held its architecture update. Most companies that make silicon, actually all three of the ones that we work with, host these events that are intended to deliver more technical details to press and to market analysts on the technical and the non-technical sides. In the architecture days, typically you get information on uh, process updates or improvements if they exist, new nodes for manufacturing. Often there's information that's highly focused on power, power delivery, efficiency. Uh, you get things like when RTX launched, a whole subsection talking about BVH and tracing rays and things like that. So they're pretty useful bits of information. And we can recap some of it here. Tom's Hardware and Anatech both have deep dives on this, but Intel also has its own deep dive that it has published on its website for first party information if you'd like to check some of that out as well. And for a couple of quick updates in the recap, we'll go through the main points. So first off, 10 nanometer super fin was one of the leading marketing terms from Intel this time. This is the latest development in regards to how it's building transistors. Intel says its super fin is its biggest intranode advancement in history and it comes at a time when Intel desperately needs it. Intel recently delayed seven nanometers, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago. It completely reshuffled its engineering leadership as a result of that. And before that, it delayed 10 nanometers. If you remember, 10 nanometers was in discussion around 2015 from Intel. Uh, some of the earliest references to 10 nanometer processors on our website when we were reporting the news was circa 2015, 2016. So they've had quite a few delays. And at this point, having a, a, a large node advancement is not only needed, but also expected. Kind of like when AMD moved from Bulldozer to Ryzen, that first generation of Zen was always going to have the biggest possible uplift. And hopefully that's going to be true for Intel as well because it's been delayed for so long on the process it's on now. Either way, though, uh, the crippling delays have put Intel in a position where it needs to extend the life of its 10 nanometer process that isn't even really out for desktop just yet. And relating to this, Superfin combines FinFET, which we've discussed uh, on the channel in the past, and that's with the key underlying ingredient, the Super MIM, or M-I-M. The Super MIM, or Metal Insulator Metal, is Intel's new MIM capacitor, with Intel touting a 5x increase in capacitance versus a standard MIM capacitor. The Super MIM is aimed at reducing voltage and mitigating V-droop, which should drive transistor performance and higher sustained frequencies and theoretically more efficient power consumption. In addition to the Super MIM, Intel has further refined its FinFET process, increasing its focus on improving gate process, 
gate pitch, and source drain. The Tiger Lake was also discussed here, and even though it's not on the DIY side, it is a significant component for Intel coming up on the mobile side. Tiger Lake, at least based on the information we have now and the leaks that are out there, looks to be potentially a serious competitor in maybe a, a more meaningful way than typically against AMD's newly found laptop market share that it has recently picked up. So Intel's new Tiger Lake will be the first to use the 10 nanometer super fin technology that was discussed in the event. It will also come with the Willow Cove microarchitecture, and that's a revision of Sunny Cove, which we talked about a few years ago, and it focuses on a higher clock speed at lower power rather than raw IPC gains. Tiger Lake will support LPDDR5, 5400, PCIe Gen 4, and Intel's XE LP graphics. Speaking of, Intel XE HPG was also discussed. HPG is the fourth and newest segment to Intel's XE graphics architecture, and within its purview will be gaming. XE HPG will focus on supporting hardware accelerated ray tracing, GDDR6 memory, and will scale back FP64 support or drop it all together. It needs to be determined. FP64 is typically reserved for higher end compute devices destined for data centers or scientific applications. Intel didn't disclose specifics such as uh, EUs per tile, tile count, or things of that nature, but Intel does expect to ship XE HPG silicon in 2021. So you don't need to worry about waiting to see how that does versus the upcoming 3000 series because they'll be quite distant. It at this point is leaning on third party fabs to manufacture XE HPG and that's going to be TSMC. Alder Lake S was also brought up. We've been talking about this one in various rumors for several months at this point, mostly socket related ones, but it's been officially disclosed and Alder Lake S is one of its upcoming desktop chips, one from Intel, obviously. Rumors at this point have long suggested that Alder Lake S would be an x86 hybrid chip, and that's turned out to be true. Intel is forging ahead with a similar hybrid computing big little paradigm that ARM pioneered previously. The idea is, in theory, simple, at least in concept of seeing it on paper. Uh, there's a combination of bigger, higher power cores that are used for more intensive tasks, while the smaller, lower power cores are reserved for less intensive workloads. We're looking at a future of forging further into MCMs or uh, multiple, not just multiple chip designs, but also multiple process nodes for the silicon that's being used so that things can be sort of dropped in and out of different CPUs, at least uh, sort of a, a side discussion there, but uh, that would be looking back at things like Sunny Cove when it was first announced. Intel outed this week that these cores would be a mix of Golden Cove cores, big, and Adam Gracemont cores for little. As we've mentioned before, having a mix of cores with split instruction set support means that there needs to be a highly optimized scheduler in place to direct the right tasks to the appropriate cores. To that end, Intel mentioned a new optimized hardware-guided OS scheduler would ship with Alder Lake S, but skimped on the specifics. Intel didn't mention if Alder Lake S is supposed to be using its SuperFin technology, but it is expected to be built on one of Intel's 10 nanometer nodes at this point and use the new LGA1700 socket for 1700 pins. There was also no mention of Intel's Favaros packaging for Alder Lake S, which it did end up using for Lakefield, uh, and that was the first of Intel's hybrid chips previously. As for the rest, we're not sure on SKUs or core counts. Rumors currently have pegged the chips topping out at an 8 plus 8 plus 1 configuration, but we need to wait on more official information from Intel to go further into the per-product specs. Next up, the Tor network is in the news. The Tor network has seemingly been hijacked to perpetrate SSL and uh, man-in-the-middle and SSL stripping attacks aimed at stealing cryptocurrency. This particular threat has apparently been around since January 2020, and it peaked in May just this year, where hackers behind the attacks controlled some of 25% of Tor's exit notes. Malicious activity regarding Tor's relays aren't exactly new, but recording to a report from Nu Sen Yu, who's been a, a security researcher and Tor network node operator, it's been on the rise. The report indicates that monitoring relay activity started around five years ago for this particular write-up, and notes that 2020 is the single worst year for malicious node activity. This is the first and only time that attackers were able to command nearly 25% of Tor's exit relays, meaning that roughly one out of every four exit nodes was compromised by an attacker. The document sums up the attacks as following, quote, the full extent of their operations is unknown, but one motivation appears to be plain and simple, profit. 
They perform person-in-the-middle attacks on Tor users by manipulating traffic as it flows through their exit relays. They selectively remove HTTP to HTTPS redirects to gain full access to plain, unencrypted HTTP traffic without causing TLS certificate warnings. This is also known as SSL stripping, and it isn't unique to Tor's network or the Tor browser. In this case, Tor's network, specifically its exit relays, are just the attack vector. The attackers are targeting Bitcoin mixer websites and rewriting Bitcoin addresses with HTTP instead of the S at the end. Rewriting the Bitcoin addresses in HTTP traffic allows the attacker to direct the Bitcoin to a different wallet rather than the original wallet. While the amount of nodes controlled by the attackers appears to be going down from what the report says, it looks like some 10% of exit relays are still directly under control of entities you wouldn't want controlling them. Multiple proposals have been made to the Tor project to mitigate further attacks at this point, such as overhauling the way in which relay operators are verified and offering better tools for tracking the relays. Finally, in a development that came out of left field and took the internet by storm, Fortnite has been removed from both Apple's App Store and Google's Play Store. Epic, for its part, isn't taking the removal line down revealing it will now be suing both Apple and Google over alleged antitrust issues. Epic also made a somewhat tongue-in-cheek video response to Apple, parodying the latter's well-known 1984 advertisement. The reason Epic got the boot from both of these stores is the same. Epic instituted its own uh, direct V-Bucks purchasing system. V-Bucks is the Fortnite in-game currency. And when Epic introduced this in-game payment system, it was able to effectively bypass or circumvent the App Store rules for both Google and Apple, as we understand them, where the two companies would receive a cut of that sale. In this instance, players buying V-Bucks directly from Epic could expect to pay around $7.99 for a thousand of them, as opposed to $10 when going through Apple's uh, own iOS store, where it takes a large cut, about 30% from what we understand, or a Google store, which takes a similar cut. The fact that Epic had this video ready to go out as soon as it was pulled from the stores tells us that this didn't catch it by surprise. The company clearly planned for this outcome and decided to go forward with uh, instituting its direct purchases anyway, because at this point, Fortnite is big enough that it probably has a GDP equivalent to some small countries. Apple and Google both have similar policies in place regarding how in-app purchases are handled. They state that in-app purchases must be transacted through Apple's App Store or Google's Play Store. This has also caused issues for other game platforms like Steam in the past. The difference here lays mostly in the platform of choice. Apple is a walled garden, where Android is in some ways more open. Fortnite getting booted from the Google Play Store, even though it is the predominant store front of choice, doesn't mean users can't still get Fortnite for Android. There are multiple app stores available within Android. The same isn't necessarily true for Apple. As of now, Fortnite can't be downloaded or installed for iOS, although users who previously had the game installed can still access it. The whole move was almost certainly premeditated and strategized by Epic going into it, because Epic has long maintained now that Apple's and Google's stores can no longer justify taking a 30% cut from its app developers. Uh, from the revenue generated by the apps. Also, given how fast Epic's responses were, the video for one and the immediate threat of lawsuits for the other, uh, it looks like it was prepared for the fallout. So Epic's battle within the app stores isn't unlike the one it's been locked in with Steam in the past over Valve's own revenue splitting policy. All in all, Epic seems to be playing its cards carefully here. It is attempting to frame the move as pro-consumer overall, because it is, after all, cheaper for the customer to buy directly. And Epic is also trying to present the story as one of sort of a, a David and Goliath, where Epic, in this instance, is the supposed uh, multi-billion dollar company underdog versus the monopolistic Apple and Google. Epic even got the hashtag free Fortnite uh, tag trending across Twitter over the last few days. And overall, it's a clever move, if not a bit funny and in some ways ironic. Epic has routinely strong-armed gamers into using its own Epic Games Store as well uh, by way of exclusive deals with developers all in the name 
of consumer choice. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, you can go to store.gamersaccess.net to pick up one of the mouse mats or the mod mats, which are in stock and shipping now, at least as of time of this video going up, they will see how long they last. Uh, mouse mats, we've got about 50% of them left after the back order is clear, so they should be in for a little bit at least. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.